Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Can you? OK. Um, so as you can tell, we don't have many students today. Uh, but if you enjoy what we do today, uh, I encourage you to spread the word. Uh, this class can continue into the third week as long as we have 15 registered students. Um, but even before the third week, I will teach this course uh, in the exact same way. So first week, I'm going to introduce the course and the idea of debating in English, and we will go over the basic rules of debating. Uh, so first, let's take a look at the Moodle page. Everything you need to um, learn debating is on the Moodle page. Of course, it's always best to learn by practicing, and you can't practice with Moodle. But if you need information, it's all on here. Uh, so first is my email. If you click on my name on Moodle, um, Sorry, one second. Ah, OK, so. If you click on my name on Moodle, it will give you a different email address. That one does not work. Please use this one. If you need to contact me, you are always welcome to send me an email. Next is the Microsoft Teams code. Um, if for some reason you are not part of the team and you don't want to wait for the school to add you, you can use this code to add yourself into the team. Uh, next, we have the syllabus. I will show you the syllabus a bit later. Class emails. If I need to tell you guys something uh, and Maybe you missed a class or something happens between classes and I need to tell you immediately. I will post something here and the system will send an email to your official school email address. Now I know that not everyone checks their school email every day, so I will also post the message in Microsoft Teams. Um, so it just in case, it's a good idea to check at least once a week, just in case something happens. Uh, the next three you cannot see at the moment. These are where I will input your semester grades. I use Moodle to calculate your grades. Uh, and in fact, this means you can also see your grades. If you go to Moodle and you click on grades, uh, you will see something like this, except it will only be one person, which is you, yourself. Um, and the way that I calculate the grades is all the numbers on the left, if you add them up, they will equal the number on the right. And the highest score for course total will be 100. Um, so if you want to check your grade in the middle of the semester, you can do that on Moodle. Right, A plus B plus C equals uh, at, at most 100. Um, the next section of Moodle is some uh, debating reference information. If you want to watch a professional English debate, here is a video on YouTube. Um, and then here are two websites that give many debating motions. A motion is the topic of the debate. So if you want to look at what people are debating, uh, if you want to think about uh, different ideas and how to prepare for different motions, you can check out these two websites. And the last section is the lectures. You'll notice that I am recording this lecture. 
Um, so each week I will upload the lecture to Moodle and uh, sorry, upload the lecture to YouTube and then post the YouTube link onto Moodle. So if you miss a lecture or you want to review, you can always uh, rewatch the lecture. Um, and these two PowerPoints are the slides that I will be using for the entire semester. So that's the Moodle page. Let's take a look at the syllabus. Uh, OK, so the. The schedule. First week, I'm going to introduce the course. I'm doing that right now. Uh, I will talk a bit about debating in English, and then I will introduce the basic format of debating. And we will immediately begin the first unit, which is how to build a case. In other words, when you first see the debating motion, how do you start preparing to debate? Week two, uh, we will get into the details of how to make arguments and how to argue against arguments. Those are called rebuttals. Week three, we will talk about extensions, which is how to give more arguments and POIs. POIs are points of interest, and these are questions you can ask the other team. Week four, we will talk about clashes and replies. These are two special kinds of speeches that teams have to give near the end of the debate. Week five, I will talk about adjudication, which means what does the judge of the debate pay attention to and how does a judge decide who wins and who loses? The next four weeks, six, seven, eight and ten will be graded debates. So these debates uh, will be graded depending on who wins, who loses. This will decide your um, AP grade. But uh, you don't need to feel too much pressure because as it says here, your debate scores are only worth 20%. The biggest proportion of your grade will be participation, 60%. So as long as you come to class uh, and you join the debates, you should pass. So no pressure there. But if you miss a class or two or like uh, you decide you don't want to join a debate, you may have to win at least one debate in order to pass. Uh, week nine, midterms, no class. Uh, your AP debate score will be your midterm score. Then starting on week 11, I will introduce a slightly harder form of debate called BP debate. You don't have to worry about that right now. Uh, but the basic idea is AP debate is two teams. BP debate is four teams. So it's a bit more complicated. Um, and so uh, that week we will focus on how to debate from the third and fourth teams. Uh, and because there are four teams instead of two, that will influence how you do uh, clashes in POI. And it will also influence how the judge will decide who wins and who loses. So we're going to spend three weeks covering that material. Then weeks 14 to 17 are the four BP debates, and these are also worth. 20%. Week 18, no class. Um, so at the end of the semester, the AP scores will be your midterm grades. The BP scores will be your final exam grades and the participation will be your daily grades. Questions? OK, so that is the. Uh, syllabus and the schedule, and so now you know like what these are for. This is where I will input your grades. OK, so that is the introduction to the course. Is there anything that you want to ask me? 
Okay. Um, before we begin talking about the detailed rules of debate, I first want to talk about the idea of debating in English. Do you have experience debating in Chinese? Anyone? No? Okay. So, um, debate is not a way for you to win arguments in real life. Debate is a game. It's kind of like chess. If you're good at chess, then you're probably good at logic and planning and strategy. But you can't actually use your chess skills in a different part of life. The same is uh, for debate. If you're good at debate, you're probably good at logic and speaking uh, and planning. Um, and if you do the kind of debate that I'm teaching, you will also be good at improvising. But if you try to use a debate speech to win a real life argument, you're probably going to lose. And that is because in real life, when you get into an argument with somebody, the person who wins is not the person who makes the most sense, right? Sometimes it's the loudest person. Sometimes it's the scariest person. Sometimes it's the person who keeps going the longest. But in real life, it is very rare for someone to rationally and reasonably win an argument. Um, so like if you learn like Taekwondo or, you know, uh, 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 like he qi dao, right? martial arts, the, the teacher always tells you, just because you're learning this doesn't mean you can go out and fight people, right? It's not the same. So why do we learn debate? It's a game, but in learning this game, uh, it can give you useful skills. For example, um, you have to be able to come up with a reasonable speech that can persuade the judge that your team makes more sense. So immediately you have English speaking skills, you have logic, you have persuasion. And if you do parliamentary debating, uh, you only have, once you see the motion, you only have 30 minutes to prepare. So it also helps you to be flexible. And if you really want to become good at this kind of debate, you have to uh, pay more attention to the different social issues in Taiwan and around the world. Uh, and you will have to constantly think about what do people believe? Why do they believe this? So if you debate for long enough, you will also become more aware of what's going on in society and have a better idea of uh, how people think and behave about these issues. Uh, and so that's why sometimes people will say, if you debate in English, it makes you a better global citizen. And so if you want to keep up to date with what's going on around the world, that will also help your English reading skills. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, debating can also help your writing skills. When you prepare a speech, uh, usually you will want to write something first. You will take notes. And these will also help you with your writing. And then you have to use your English listening skills to understand what the other team is saying. So at the end of the day, English debating can help you improve your English ability. And it will also give you a reason to practice using English. During debate and also like in daily life. So there are many good reasons to learn debate. Just remember that um, winning arguments is not one of them. Um, now, debating is a game. Every game has its own kind of bias or its, uh, its own value system. Like when you play chess, there must be winners and there must be losers, right? Um, 
when you play Monopoly, uh, the value is to make as much money as you can. Debate also has its own value bias. And the bias is uh, debates favor what's known as consequentialism, which means what does this do to people? Do they benefit? Uh, are they harmed? How many people are hurt, are killed? Uh, how much money does it bring people? These kinds of values. So it's very rare to see in a debate uh, values such as uh, like spiritual values or like the value of art, uh, the value of leading a more, a, a richer and fuller life, those kinds of ideas. They do sometimes appear, but it's not very often. Uh, so it's also useful to remember that um, the kind of reasoning that you learn in debate is only one kind of reasoning. In daily life, people believe things and do things for many different reasons. But in debate, we will only use some of those reasons. Right? So uh, debate is not a representation of real life. It is only part of real life. Right. Uh, do you have questions about the idea of debating? Okay, so let's talk about a specific kind of debate, namely Asian parliamentary debating. Parliamentary debating, as the name suggests, is taken from the UK Parliament. And so the names of the, the roles played by people in the debate and the way that they speak, the way that they interact, is based on the UK's parliamentary system. Um, Asian parliamentary debate is two teams. Each team has three people. But there are four speeches per team. So on each team, one person will have to speak twice. And the basic structure of an AP speech looks like this. For the three first speeches, each speech can last up to seven, seven and a half minutes. The first minute and the last minute are protected time. In the middle, five minutes, the other team can stand up and ask questions. So only in the first and last minute can the other team not be allowed to ask questions. This means that in a very uh, fast paced and exciting debate, your speech in the middle might be full of opposing team members standing up to ask questions. It can be kind of uh, nerve wracking, can make you a bit nervous. But you don't have to answer their questions. They stand up and, and say, I have a POI, which means a point of interest, which is a question. Or they might say, uh, sir or ma'am, or they might say, before you move on, any way to get your attention to let you know that they have a question. But then they have to wait for your response. You can accept the question by stopping and letting them ask the question. You can deny the question by telling them to sit down, tell them later, not now, or simply say no. Some people like to keep uh, people with POIs waiting. So they'll just ignore the, the person asking the question, and if they don't sit down, later on they will ask them to sit down. So it's only nervous because keep, people keep standing up and asking questions, but you don't have to answer their questions if you don't want to. Um, but it's usually a good idea to answer at least one question. So the first three speeches on each side uh, is this kind of speech. But in AP style, there is a fourth speech. One of the debaters on each team has to give a reply speech. The reply speech does not allow questions, and it is only four minutes long. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later in the semester when we get to the closing part of the debate. 
so this is the order in which debaters give their speeches. There are two teams. The first team is called proposition or government. This team supports the motion. Whatever the motion says, this team thinks it's a good idea. We should do it. The other team is the opposition. They oppose the motion. Whatever the motion says, they think it's a bad idea. We shouldn't do it. Um, there are three members to each team, which are the first three uh, titles. The first, uh, let's go side by side. So for proposition side, the first speaker has the title of prime minister. The second speaker has the title of deputy prime minister. The third speaker is government whip. Uh, in Chinese, this is bang bian. In an actual parliament, the whip is responsible for making sure that everyone in the same party votes in the same way. So they keep party members in order. They whip party members, right? Uh, and then one of the, either the prime minister or the deputy prime minister has to give a reply speech. On the opposition side, the first speaker is named leader of the opposition. Second speaker is deputy leader of the opposition. Third speaker is opposition whip. And then either the LO or the DLO have to give a reply speech. But notice the order of the speeches. Left, right, left, right, left, right. But then the opposition reply goes first. And then the government reply goes last. Um, again, this is on Moodle. You might want to spend some time remembering this information. Because when we talk about these roles, this is Jiao Se. Um, I will usually use the abbreviations. So instead of saying the first speaker, I might say the PM, or I might say the the DLO, and I'll expect you to remember which person I'm talking about. So we can actually calculate how long a debate will go. Each speaker uh, speaks for around seven minutes, and then the last two speeches are four minutes. So that's 7 times 6 is 42, plus 8 is around 50 minutes. If you uh, include t the time used to walk around and switch positions, uh, it's around 55, 56 minutes per debate. Um, and so this class is 110 minutes if we count the break in the middle. Let's not count the break. It's 100 minutes. So when you guys do a full debate, you will have one period to do the debate. The middle break time, the judge, me, uh, I will think who wins, who loses. And then the second period, I will explain why I gave that decision. And then we can talk about the debate as, and I can point out ways that you can improve. Do you have questions about this? Okay. So, um, how when you first see a motion, what does it look like? There are a few common motion types. Uh, the first one goes, this house would. Usually, you will only see the abbreviation. So, it's THW, blah, blah, blah. So, for example, this house would abolish homework. In Chinese, this is the word abolish does not mean ban, jingzi. Abolish does not simply mean we don't do that anymore. It means we will change the system so that this no longer exists. So for example, um, after the American Civil War, the US abolished slavery. That does not simply mean that it is illegal to own black people. It means that the entire economic system changed so that black people could be free. So the first kind of motion, this house would, wants the government to do something. And the opposition therefore has to reply that we should not do this thing. The second kind of motion is called this house believes that. This is the most common type of motion. 
usually it is also about doing something. But there's a little bit of space to let the government decide whether they actually want to do it or whether they will simply say that it's a good idea to do it. Um, it there's a bit of difference. So, for example, this house believes that there should be no homework in college. If this is the motion, the government side can choose either to actually abolish college homework, or they can simply argue that it would be better if colleges did not have homework. If they argue that we should abolish homework, they then have to prove, uh, they have to present a system of education in college without homework and prove that this system is better than the uh, current system. But if they only argue that it would be better without homework, then they don't have to present a new system. Does that make sense? Uh, so this kind of motion gives you a bit of space to decide. The third kind of motion is called this house supports. Uh, and it simply means we think it is better to have it than to not have it. So this house supports homework. Uh, the government does not have to present a system and the opposition cannot say, well, if you think it's such a bad idea, why don't you do something about it? Because that's not what the motion says. The opposite of this house supports is this house regrets, simply saying that it is worse to have something than to not have something. So these are the four main motion types. But sometimes you will see strange motions with additional information. Maybe you might have a motion that says this house as Ming Chuan University would abolish homework. So when we say this house, but Rin, usually we don't have to think about where that is. We usually just assume it's uh, either Taiwan or like Asia or the West, a Western country, anything that makes sense. But sometimes the motion will define where you are. So if the motion this house as Ming Chuan University would abolish homework, uh, you therefore have to discuss details related to Ming Chuan. If the motion were this house as National Taiwan University would abolish homework, then you would have to use details from NTU. Does that make sense? Um, for a bigger motion, it might be like this house as North Korea or like this house as the United Nations. It will limit what kind of arguments you can make. Um, one of the common settings of the house is this house as a developing nation or as an underdeveloped nation. And what that does is um, in, a, in a typical debate, if the opposition says that's too expensive, we shouldn't do that, the government can simply say, we think it's worth spending money and we will find the money from other places. And, but if the house is defined as a developing or underdeveloped country, the government can't do that because the definition of developing or underdeveloped is the government doesn't have unlimited money. So if the motion is set in a developing or underdeveloped country and the opposition says that's too expensive, the government then has to actually say where they will get the money. The second kind of additional information is uh, the motion gives you some kind of condition. So for example, uh, assuming that uh, China will attack Taiwan within two years, this house would abolish homework, something like that. And you have to use that information in your debate. Uh, you cannot debate about that information. You can't say, oh, we don't think China will attack in two years. It's part of the, def the, the motion. You have to use it. And then finally, you will sometimes see motions that use 
uh, technical information, technical words in the motion. And so uh, usually the person who creates this kind of motion knows that most people don't know this word. So they will add additional information after the motion. In that kind of motion, you have to, if you use that word or that part of the motion, the meaning of that word must be whatever the additional information says. So for example, if the motion is this house would abolish homework and, it, and then it says homework means any work that a student must do outside of class. Then during the debate, you cannot say homework only includes like papers and written homework because the motion already gave you a definition. So those are the, the types of motions that you might see, including some of them in this class. Questions? Okay. So when you first see a motion, how do you prepare? In parliamentary debate, as I mentioned, AP debate, you only have 30 minutes. And um, if there's any ambiguity in the motion, if there are things that are unclear that may have more than one definition, government side, proposition side, gets to define every word in the motion. So if you're on proposition side, you have to think about what is the best way to define this motion. If you're on the opposition side, you have to prepare for different kinds of definitions. Again, it's kind of like chess. Um, you know how like chess grandmasters, they memorize thousands of different ways to play chess. Um, really good debaters also have a sense of, OK, this is the motion. This is what the motion wants us to talk about. These are the different ways that we can talk about it. Uh, and this is what experience means. The more you debate, the more familiar you are with the different ways of presenting and attacking a motion. Uh, but in the beginning, we can start from the basics. If the motion is this house would abolish homework, what is the spirit of the motion? What does the motion want you to talk about? Um, you know how like uh, laws have loopholes? Right, so you can do things according to the law, but it's something that the law is is trying to prevent you from doing. The same thing with the debate motion. Uh, and this is why we say you should follow the spirit of the motion. If for the motion, this house would abolish homework, you want to talk about like um, wasting resources because you have to use a lot of paper, um, to give out and grade homework. It takes lots of time and you prepare an entire debate based on resources. That's not the spirit of the motion. Uh, the spirit of the motion of abolishing homework would be uh, more related to learning effectiveness. The purpose of uh, class, uh, what classroom activities, the purpose of education, uh, that kind of thing. So, for example, the government side, uh, and this is the next point. Um, when you find yourself having to defend a motion, if you have to say if this is a good idea, you should think about why is it a good idea? What kind of value is worth defending in this motion? And the same for the opposition side. Why is it a bad idea? What kind of value is worth protecting from the motion? So in this motion, the government side might think about values like diligence, you know, hard work, um, practical knowledge. So not just sitting and watching a lecture, but actually practicing what you learn. Um, and also like uh, independence for learning. When you do homework, 
you're not just doing what the teacher tells you. You have to solve the problem yourself. So it promotes independence in learning. These are some of the values that government might support. Opposition side might talk about, um, first of all, they might talk about independence of the learner. So not just learning on your own, but finding your own way to learn. When you do homework, yes, you have to do the homework yourself, but the homework is set by the teacher. The opposition side can say that maybe students will learn better if they find their own way to learn. Uh, another value might be uh, the value of a, what do you call this, a general education. So the idea is that the point of school is not what you learn from the teacher, but what you learn from being in school, being around different people, having access to different kinds of resources. And the teacher is simply more like a guide. Is not the answer to all your questions, but a helper to help you learn what you want to learn. Um, so the value of general education in Chinese, we call this tong si jiao yu, would be another value that the opposition side can defend. So this is something to think about when you prepare a debate. What does the motion want you to value? Uh, the next two points go together. Once you have figured out the value that you want to defend, you have to decide how hard should I defend it? If government side, your value is the value of hard work, um, there's more than one way to actually defend this value. If you think that hard work is truly the most important thing to learn in school, uh, then you would, your ideal school would be a school where all the students do lots of work all day, right? Because that's what you think is most important. This kind of case is called a hard case. It's hard because it's very different from what's currently the situation. But sometimes it's worth building a hard case because if you build a soft case, if you simply say, we think work is, hard work is important. The opposition can say, well, then why do you let students choose their own class? Why do you give them break time? And then government will have to explain why they let students have some freedom and relaxation, even though it's not hard work. Does that make sense? Because in real life, nothing is absolute, right? No, um, So in when you put that situation in a debate, if you go the hard case, you don't have to defend the compromises and the relative uh, differences in real life. But it, it, uh, the hard case does not look like real life. That's what's hard about it. On the other side, if you decide to go to a soft case, it, the, your ideas will be more persuasive immediately. Like as soon as you say them, people will think, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. But if the opposition keeps asking you hard questions, it could be harder to defend your case. So this is something you have to think about. Do you want to go the hard case? Is it defensible? Can you actually defend such a big difference from uh, the current situation? If you go the soft case, is it consistent? Are you able to defend from the opposition's attacks? The next point, is your case feasible? Feasible means it can work, like you can actually do it. If the motion this house would abolish homework, if your idea is uh, we will prevent every single teacher from giving any kind of assignment or homework, we will prevent all students from looking at their textbooks outside of class. That's not feasible. You can't actually do that. There's no physical way that you can track each student outside of the classroom to make sure they're not looking at their textbook. Uh, so 
that's not something that you should say in the debate. Another way to think about this question is, does it rely on magic? If your emotion is uh, this house would implement a one state solution in Israel. Uh, so this is the Israel Palestine conflict. And the motion asks you to uh, create one country for both sides. The government will have to explain how they will do that. Especially the government will have to explain how will they get both sides to agree to be part of the same country. And they can't simply say, oh, they will want to become the same country. That is magic. It's obviously not true. Uh, the next one, when you think about what people will do or how people will react to this change, what are you assuming about human psychology? In the practice motion, this house would abolish homework. Uh, the government and the opposition might assume different things about students' attitudes toward homework. The government wants to abolish homework, so they might assume that students hate homework. But opposition wants to keep homework, so they might assume that students like homework for some reasons. Um, and in a debate, it's really hard to prove that people are like this instead of like that. So when you prepare for a debate, you should think about your assumptions about human psychology so you can prepare to try to convince the judge that your picture of human psychology makes more sense. And then finally, if you are the proposition side, you should also think about, should I limit the house? Should we define this house to be a certain place um, like in, in my earlier example, should we define it as Ming Chuan University? That kind of thing. Questions? So as I mentioned earlier, the government side gets to define the motion. This house would abolish homework. What does homework mean? What does it include? How will you abolish the system of homework? Will you replace it with something or will you simply like not have homework? And then as the last point says, do you want to set the house or will you leave it open to like a general education setting? Uh, and whatever government says, as long as it makes sense, opposition has to continue with. The opposition cannot change the meaning of the words as defined by the government side. So it sounds like government side has an advantage, right? They know what they're talking about. Opposition has to wait for the PM to speak before they know what they're talking about, right? It seems a bit unfair, right? But on the other side, uh, when government is preparing its case, it doesn't know how opposition will respond. It's basically, uh, government side is basically imagining an opposition. But the opposition side, as soon as the debate begins, they have a real opponent. They don't have to imagine their opponent. They have someone they can actually argue against. So even though opposition uh, starts preparing a bit later, but once they do prepare and are ready, uh, they are more relevant to the actual debate, not an imagined debate. So at the end of the day, both sides each has advantages and disadvantages. It's basically fair. So in this kind of debate, as I said, there's a lot of improvisation. Uh, depending, on, depending on what the other side says, depending on if your team members make mistakes, you have to be able to uh, prepare to change with the situation. So often in a parliamentary debate, you will see like when one team uh, is speaking, the other team will be writing notes, will be passing papers to each other, will be trying to put together a response. Um, and sometimes you will also see them like whispering to each other, but it's usually not a good idea to talk 
when someone is giving a speech. Uh, because if you talk to somebody, if you it's like uh, texting, right? If you send a text message, the other person can decide whether to read it now or later. But if you talk to somebody, uh, the, the person who's listening cannot hear the speaker. They're just listening to you. Uh, so that's why people pass papers around. It's more flexible. So that is during the preparation period. Once you see the motion, how do you think about the motion? But then you have to start putting things on paper and preparing the first speech. The PM has the advantage because the PM doesn't have to reply to anybody. Their speech is uh, whatever they say is part of the debate. There's no question about this. So the PM speech should be carefully written. Um, and the result is on the second half of this slide. This is what the speech should look like. It should give a background to uh, the motion. It should present the problem that the motion is trying to solve. It should explain how government side solves the problem. Uh, then the PM should give definitions for any words that might be unclear. And then finally, the PM will explain exactly how uh, the motion using the definitions will solve the problem. So that's the speech. But how do you prepare for this speech? Um, just like a writing competition, right? The competition gives you a topic and you have to write about that topic. In a debate, the judge will give you a motion and give you a side. And you have to write or you have to talk about that motion from the side that is given to you. So the first thing to think about is what does the motion actually do? Now for easy motions like uh, this house would abolish homework, it's very simple. Once the motion goes through, there will be no homework. That is exactly what the motion does. Uh, this is the part of the motion that you cannot change. You cannot say we will have homework sometimes. Uh, you must have no homework. But sometimes the motions can be a bit more complicated. For example, um, uh, Yeah, you can see the difference. Um, you could say like, uh, OK, this house as Taiwan would apply to join the United States. What exactly does this motion do? It doesn't make Taiwan part of the US. What it does is it tells the world that Taiwan wants to be part of the US. So for the proposition side, they cannot say once we become part of the US because that's not part of the motion. You can say that we hope that if we become part of the US, something, something will happen. But then you have to bring that back to the current situation, which is we are not part of the US. Does that make sense? So what exactly does the motion do? This must be your solution. And from that solution, you will try to think of what is the problem? Why do we need to do this? What is the urgency? Why is it bad if we don't do this? That's the problem. So abolish homework. Why do we want to have no homework? In other words, what is bad about homework? It, for example, it takes up students time outside of the classroom. It limits their focus when they're learning in a class, right? They only focus on the homework part and they may ignore other parts. Um, if the homework is like a standard assignment, then it emphasizes the idea that there is a correct answer to every question, right? These are some of the problems that might uh, 
lead the government side to want to get rid of homework. It's usually a good idea to choose the biggest problem first. Once you have selected a problem, you then have to talk about why this problem exists currently. Uh, why does the status quo exist? Status quo is Latin. The full term is status quo ante, which means the situation as before. In other words, the current situation. This is a term that debaters love to use, status quo. It just means current situation. So if homework is so bad, why do we have homework? So you can talk about uh, things like uh, too many students, not enough teachers, it's hard to teach to each individual student. And so to save time and energy, teachers give homework to every student. Or you can say like students learn many different subjects. They don't have enough time to learn each subject. So uh, the teacher needs to use more of the students time at home to make sure that they fully learn what they're supposed to learn. Right. These are some possible reasons for why the problem exists. Now at this point you might be thinking, but is it true? Are these really the reasons why we have homework? I don't know. It's just a game. Remember that it's just a game. This is not a research paper. You are not making a policy speech. It's just a game. As long as what you say sounds convincing, it sounds like it could be true. That's good enough. So once you have the problem, the solution, and you explain like why the problem exists, then you have to explain exactly how the solution will solve the problem. So if you selected the problem, which is that uh, homework limits a student's learning, they only focus on the homework. Then how will getting rid of homework solve the problem? Because at this point, the opposition might say, if you get rid of homework, this and which means you make the students do that work in class, the students will still only focus on that part of the class. Right? If like in grammar class, instead of giving you grammar homework, we do the grammar problems in class, students will still focus on those problems. So how exactly does it solve the problem by eliminating homework? So this is something that the government side has to explain. Something like, uh, um, uh, students, once they leave the classroom, they uh, no longer think only about the class. They have many different parts of life. Uh, and so it's a kind of reset. It's like turning off the computer. So when they come back to the classroom, the focus has been reset and it's not continuing to focus on the same problem all the time. That's one way to explain uh, how the solution will work. Uh, another way might be, um, you might say that if we get rid of homework, teachers will understand, uh, teachers, uh, teachers gave homework because there was not enough time in the classroom. If we get rid of homework, that does not increase classroom time. So we don't have to worry about teachers forcing students to do homework in class. And so by getting rid of these homework problems, uh, students will not be forced to focus only on the homework problems. That kind of uh, explanation is another example. And then finally, think about what you're saying. Think about your explanation. Do you need to define some of the words in the motion to make sure that you are talking about exactly what the motion wants you to talk about? So in our example, uh, abolishing homework so that students will focus on different things, you might want to define homework as a set of questions with a standard correct answer. Uh, 
Um, because like in real life, there are many different kinds of homework, right? If I said, go home and prepare a presentation on any topic, this kind of homework would not fit into what government side is talking about. So once the government side prepares the debate, they need to think about how to limit the meaning of the words in the motion so that we are actually talking about what we want to talk about. Uh, another term in this motion would be abolish. How exactly would you abolish homework? We talked about two situations, right? One is uh, teachers would not force students to do the homework questions. The second one is teachers would force students to do the homework in class. So is there a way to define the word abolish to prevent the second kind of situation? You might say uh, by abolishing homework, we mean that we will uh, ban teachers from giving standard correct answer questions as practice. And so in this case, even if teachers wanted to have students practice in class, they could not use uh, questions with standard correct answers. So once you figure out these five things, then you put them in the correct order, and that is the PM speech. Now, uh, at more advanced levels of debate, the PM will still have time after talking about all of this. And so usually the PM will give one, sometimes even two arguments in addition to explaining the government case. Uh, but for now, uh, just worry about uh, designing the case. This is the most important thing. Do you have questions about the PM speech? Let's practice. Um, Let's see. I want to divide you guys into two groups. So, uh, you three in one group, and then you four in another group. Yeah, okay. So, uh, I'll give you a motion, and please prepare together a PM speech. Right. Think about what it, what does the motion do? What kind of problem does this solve? How did this problem begin in the first place? How will we actually solve the problem? And think about if there are any words that you need to clarify. OK, let me give you a motion. This house would abolish PE class in college. Uh, so it is currently break time. Uh, I will come back after the break and see if you are ready to uh, explain your PM speech.
Okay. I think I actually missed the first bell, right? 我们应该是一点四十下课，一点五十上课。Sorry about that. Uh, but you got ten minutes of rest in between. So, um, work with your group members. Think about each of these questions. How would you put together a PM speech for this motion? So the reason that the order in the top half and in the bottom half are different is because uh, 
if you look at the bottom half, it looks like an essay, right? This is the order you would write an essay. But in a real essay, you would be given a problem and you would have to come up with a solution. But in debating, you start with the solution and you find a problem for that solution. So the order is a, the preparation order is a little bit different.
Testing, 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 testing. Would you like to yield back your last minute? Yeah, OK. So uh, rock, paper, scissors, who goes first? Saichun. You guys want to go first? All right, please come to the front. About the background. So, why are the P class? Um, because uh, we want students to be healthy, but now students don't like P class. They think it's to waste their time. I'll talk about a problem. I used to be a cheerleader, and I think the P class is not necessary because in P class we are just sit there and walk or just do some useful thing. Then, mm. anyway, I think that's necessary, and. We already have the school team, so if children, uh, if students want to learn some about PE, they will join the school team, not a PE class. So it's necessary. Unnecessary, yes. So the solution for um, this problem is we'll move the P class into after school, school activities and um, move the time to post 5 p.m. So it's, um, those who want to attend the classes will volunteer and they will also have a, the time and space to exercise if they feel their health is at risk. Teacher, P teacher will lose their job. Yeah. <laughs> um, we need to um, stand. Uh, because P teacher can be a club. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh -huh.
Thank you. So um, let's review what they told us. This group says that originally we had PE class because the school is concerned about students' health and they want students to be healthier. So they force students to go to PE class to exercise. Uh, the problem is that, uh, first of all, students don't like being forced to waste time to exercise. And it's wasting time because PE class. Uh, first of all, let, let's start from here. This makes more sense. It's wasting time because if students really want to exercise, they can join the school sports teams. In English, these are called varsity teams. Uh, and the other side of this is that because it's a college which focuses on learning, so even for PE class, there will be times when students are sitting around listening to the teacher talk. So even the PE class in the status quo does not guarantee exercise, right? So on the one hand, students don't like being forced to take PE class. On the other hand, they don't need to if they want exercise. And then also PE class doesn't guarantee exercise. Those are the problems. Uh, and they defined uh, abolish to mean that they will move the content of these PE courses to after school and make them. I guess what you're trying to say is they now become clubs. Right, because if PE teachers become club advisors, then these are just clubs. Yeah, right. Uh, and so PE teachers will not lose their jobs. They, their jobs would just change. I, I think that's it, right? That's all. That's what you guys said. Did I miss anything? OK, so uh, let's look at their answer. First of all, they didn't really explain how. The motion would solve these problems. So you could say something like. Um, by abolishing PE class, we no longer force students to take a class that they dislike. So that's what the first solution. Um, we no longer waste their time by trying to make PE class more academic, where they have to learn theory and things like that. And you can also say that uh, this motion would help promote the school sports teams. Um, students who wanted to get more exercise uh, would be more willing to join the sports teams. So that's a part of the speech that uh, is not yet complete. Um, but there's another, I think, a bigger problem with this speech, which is it's a bit too soft. If you really think that uh, PE is a bad idea, then moving PE class to after school, keeping the same teachers with the same experience and the basically a similar format doesn't really solve um, these two problems. It may solve time wasting because students can choose not to go. But if they do go, the teachers might still teach in the same way. And uh, students may still decide to go to these after school PE classes instead of joining the sports team. Right, so it's a bit too soft. You're in your mind. You still support PE classes. You're just forced to say that there's a bad idea because I told you to. Right, the principle is not very consistent. Uh, but it's a good first try. It's relatively uh, complete. Most of the things are are there. Good. Uh, second group. Okay, hello guys. Okay, um, 
so the, the background is like uh, is in Minchan University and uh, just like and just like group one says uh, uh, the teachers and the government wants us to exercise because we are uh, uh, busy working on school subjects or homework but the problem is there's no uh, academic credit on P class and maybe if if we want to learn uh, we want to choose another courses but the school rules needs us to choose P class so we can't yes no solution in we can open the gymnastics. Uh, we can open the gymnastics uh, in school. Can, um, and maybe we can change the P class to elective. To make the students who want to uh, exercise to volunteer and to volunteer. So, um, so if, if students wants to choose P class they can choose by themselves and uh, so let's take a look at this group's answer they think that the reason we have PE class is because students are focused on studying very hard and they don't get enough exercise. Uh, and so the school, this is something that maybe you forgot to say, uh, in order to encourage exercise, the school forces students to take PE class. Right now, the problem they say is that uh, students have to take PE class, but they don't get credit. And so this takes away their opportunity to take other courses for credit. Uh, in economics, we call this opportunity cost, right? You take this instead of that. Uh, and it's not an equal choice because that has credit, but this does not. Uh, and so in their definition, they said that they set the house. They set the house at MCU. Um, and so when they give the mechanism, first we will open the gym for free use. Uh, this is a detail of MCU, which is that the gym is often not available for free use because there's PE class. Right. So that, that's something you should mention that right now at MCU, the gym is not always open. So we would open up the gym. Uh, and this would solve the original problem of students not getting enough exercise. That's something you have to say. You have to bring it back to the problem. And the second mechanism is that when you say abolish, you don't mean no PE class. You mean that PE is now elective. Uh, so you should explain that. Uh, elective means that there will be credit. Right. That's also something you should say. If you say that elective classes have credit, that solves this problem of no credit. So that is what you would put here. By uh, abolish means um, uh, make elective, and that can solve the above problems. Did I miss anything? OK, so let's think about this answer. Uh, so like the first group, 
it feels like this group also believes that PE class uh, is useful and that some kind of PE class should be preserved. Um, and so um, when they talk about like, creating an open gym, making PE class elective, um, they agree with the original reason for having PE class. They just think that it should be this problem should be solved in a better way. Now, this kind of debating strategy can be a bit dangerous uh, if opposition comes up and says, we also think PE class is great, but we don't think these problems exist. And then they explain the case in a way that makes your problems disappear. So this is also a, this case is also kind of soft. Basically, all opposition has to do is say, OK, fine, we will give credit to PE classes. In that case, there's no difference between the two sides. Right, because you're saying we'll give credit to PE classes. They're saying we'll give credit to PE. So like it's the same thing. Um, so it's a bit too soft. Um, but that's fine because this motion was created to go against your intuition. I chose a motion that you probably don't agree with to help you practice thinking from a different point of view. So if I were to give a PM speech, I would say something like this. I agree. So. The reason that colleges have PE class is because traditionally college has been hard to get into. And so students have to study very hard to get into college. And once they get into college, they keep on studying hard. So college students traditionally were not healthy, were not strong. And uh, if they turn out not to be good students, they would not be able to contribute much to society. So traditionally, colleges wanted to help their students become uh, more rounded people, more comprehensive students. But the problem today is that uh, students are, it is much easier for students to get into college. You have all different kinds of people in college and forcing every student to take PE class um, actually limits the exercise that students can get. Uh, in this motion, uh, we want to solve that problem. We want to promote all kinds of exercise and unlimited exercise for our uh, diverse student body. And so when we say we want to abolish PE class, that's exactly what we mean. No PE class. Instead of PE classes, we will have PE stations and each PE teacher will uh, serve at each uh, station of expertise during set hours and students can come and uh, exercise and play sports uh, whenever the teacher is there. So it's not forcing students into a class, it's allowing students to, to uh, exercise however they want to freely. Uh, and in order to do this, we will hire more PE teachers to make sure that students can have more chances to choose the kind of exercise they want. And then, uh, so how does this motion solve the problem of, uh, oh, first of all, why are students limited by PE class? Well, because today's students are much more uh, well-rounded they have a better uh, work life balance. They understand the importance of exercise. And so students today will naturally want to exercise on their own. And uh, but if you create a PE class and you force them to exercise at certain parts of the week, some students will feel like, oh, I've already done my exercise. I don't need to exercise more or they might think, I don't have to worry about exercise. The school is already forcing me to exercise. That's enough. And it's just not true. Uh, as students become busier and busier in modern life, uh, lots of their entertainment is also static and, and 
lacking in exercise. So if they really want to exercise, we shouldn't uh, make them dislike it by forcing them to do it in a limited time. And so by giving them opportunities and professional support, uh, we are encouraging students to develop their natural interest in sports and exercise. Uh, and then I also might want to define uh, the house as MCU because at MCU, even if you don't exercise, simply walking up and down the campus is exercise. So those are some I also uh, some other ideas that you can consider about this motion. Questions? OK, so do you have questions about the PM speech? If not, I want to move on to the LO speech. The first speech from the opposition side. Now, uh, as I said, the preparation for this speech is not as fixed because you're not exactly sure what the PM will say. Um, but once you realize what is going on, you have a choice. You can either simply say that the government will make things worse, so we should oppose the government. Or you can say uh, that the government, uh, the problem does exist, but the government will make things worse. So we, opposition, also want to try to solve the same problem, but in a different way. And this is called counter proposing. Now, usually we do not encourage counter proposing because it means more work. But sometimes the problem is so serious and obvious that it is impossible for opposition to say there's no problem. Uh, so like. Uh, Let's see. This house would continue to buy oil and gas from Russia. The opposition has to say that they will not continue buying oil and gas from Russia. But the main problem that government side will want to solve is that energy prices are too high. If we don't buy from Russia, uh, there will not be enough money for our people to buy energy during the winter and many people will freeze and die. Opposition cannot simply say that's not true because that's obviously true. That's exactly what's happening so far. So not only does opposition have to say we will not buy oil and gas from Russia, they also have to say how they will solve the bigger problem of not enough energy. So in that kind of motion, the opposition has to counter propose. Uh, but in general, for the usual motions, the opposition side can decide whether to simply oppose or whether to counter propose. So how do you prepare an LO speech? First of all, again, start from the motion. What does the motion do? And in the opposition case, you have to think about why it is a bad idea to do this. Uh, and then you can brainstorm ideas and reasons, but in order to, to actually start creating your speech, you have to listen to the PM. What are the definitions? What is the mechanism? Uh, is their case a hard case or a soft case? What kind of problem do they start with? The details of the speech uh, are what you have to pay attention to. And then so if you agree that there's a problem, you will need to counter propose. And if you counter propose, you also need to come up with a mechanism and a solution. But if you don't counter propose. Then you simply have to explain. This point, fourth point why government's idea is a bad idea. Uh, so really, the most simple LO speech will already start to give arguments. 
because it the LO doesn't need to spend so much time uh, on defining and explaining. They can simply say, no, it's bad. So, homework. <laughs> uh, for the motion, this house would abolish PE class. Please prepare an LO speech. Um, please prepare to put together an LO speech. Uh, and next class, I will give the PM speech and you will give an LO speech uh, to reply to me. Does that make sense? OK, so do you have questions about the LO speech? OK, uh, I think the bell already went. Did you guys hear the bell? No, but it's it's 240. So I guess that means I'll see you guys next week. I mentioned OK, that's mentioned.